biotech has been a, a very successful industry for, for decades, but I always thought of kind of the amazing opportunities now outside of, of biotech, particularly in creating new materials, bio-inspired materials, or in new foods such as cultivated meat. So um, while starting at Imperial, I joined the Synthetic Biology Society. So this really was just a group of uh, students, um, postgraduates that were excited about synthetic biology, wanted to talk about synthetic biology. And we, I met there, my, my co-founders, actually part of a, a larger group that wanted to just get started on a project using these tools, exploring these tools. Um, and I was quite lucky at Imperial that we have what's called the advanced hack space. So this is really like a, a maker space. So you have your, your woodwork and metalwork and electronic um, space, but also they have a, a bio lab. And so we were able to, to form as a group um, to share ideas and, and really think about how we could start tinkering, or, tinkering around in this bio lab. Um, to start using these these new tools in, in bioengineering. Um, and so as we were looking at ideas, and this was in, in 2019 uh, or late 2018, early 2019, around that time, there were actually lots of protests in, in London and the UK by a group called Extinction Rebellion. So this was all very climate-focused protests. And, and for us, that meant kind of climate change and really the, the challenge of grappling with climate change so that we have a, a planet to, to live on over uh, the next decades and a few hundred years. Um, that was really front of mind. And, and for us, there had to be a technical solution to climate change. Relying on mass behavioral change is incredibly difficult and a slow process. So we thought, you know, we, we have the tools now to really work on a, a technical solution to climate change and the meat industry being so uh, broken as it is in, in its an industrial form um, was kind of something that we thought now with the tools in bioengineering and the advent of cultivated meat, we could really uh, make a difference there. So we were we were totally sold on the idea of cultivated meat. Um, and so when we then went to ask, well, you know, if this technology is so potentially uh, impactful, why, why can't we buy it today? So we went to basically kind of really uh, go into a very uh, rapid deep dive into cultivated meat. What was the production process? We spoke to a bunch of companies. Um, we kind of tried to consider why the first burger that was actually um, announced and unveiled in the world was, was in London. Um, why that burger had costed you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to make. Um, and really what kept coming back again and again was that the key cost in producing cultivated meat was the cost of feeding the cells with nutrients. This, this growth medium that is fed to cells to, to grow, say, cow muscle fat cells or pig fat cells or, or salmon connective tissue. Um, and what this industry or, or biomedical research really has been relying on since the 50s is the use of uh, animal serum, and in particular, fetal bovine serum, which provides a very rich cocktail of nutrients and signaling stimuli to help cells grow. Um, but it's very expensive. It really goes against the entire ethos of uh, an animal-free production process. Um, and really, as a byproduct of the meat industry, it's not one that scales. And so we, we started the project because we saw growth media really as a, an engineering challenge as opposed to a, kind of a scientific challenge, uh, whereby it's really, for us, a matter of going, okay, these are some of the raw materials that we need to produce in a cheaper way or find source alternatives to. And then it was this optimization challenge of going, we have this, this library of new ingredients, we need to grow cells uh, and we can capture this kind of data around cell growth and behavior. How do we run the best experiments to, to optimize the combination of those ingredients to get affordable, high-performance growth media? So, so that's really how we how we started, and and for us, we we continue to take this very much uh, data driven engineering approach to biology, um, and since then, as I said, we kind of grew out out of this project in 2020, joined the Indie Bio program, so it's a, a life science accelerator based in New York, and that was really when that project turned into a into a company. So to keep the experiments going in the meantime, we've been bouncing around several competitions, both within Imperial, within the UK and across the world. Um, and we reached a point where it was either 
this project was was going to stop because we we're going to run, run out of money or we really consider what it would take to build a company out of this and, and, and maximize the impact that we had. Um, and for us, it was really a, a no-brainer in, in going after building Maltus into a, into a larger entity to bring this new technology and, and solution to the market. Um, and, and really, our mission is to make cultivated meat an affordable and sustainable choice for as many people as possible. So it really made sense to be working on enabling technology that could help you know, dozens or hundreds of companies around the world to bring various types of, of new products to market rather than ourselves trying to produce produce lots of cultivated meat and, and rely on maybe our branding or marketing as a, as a form of competitive advantage. That's really cool. Yeah, I I definitely think you guys are doing something quite bold because you know, you're, you're working on stuff that's that's kind of part of like an emerging industry, right? And you're also, I think, working on a product that there's probably not too many, there's not probably not like a great blueprint for like, you know, what is the path for how do you, how do you start a, a cell media company, right? Like that's a very new thing. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have, you have things to connect that to for this next question. Um, but what are some of the things you had to learn through your journey with the company? Um, what are some big lessons you've taken away so far? Yeah, I think that the first one is we're a kind of group of scientists and engineers that suddenly had to learn all this this business stuff. Uh, we had to learn how to you know pitch to investors and build financial projections and create you know pitch decks to to sell our story and our science to uh, different different audiences. Um, so that the business side is, is a lot more messy. It's, it's based on you know, interpersonal relationships and um, really relying on those relationships and, and building relationships over time to uh, drive things forward. And in the time that we started, um, it was really in the midst of, of COVID where the company kind of grew. So um, that for better or worse meant that we were speaking to lots of people just, just like this um, through, through a camera. And so that there was a lot to learn there in how to kind of, uh, yeah, keep moving things forward uh, through through conversations and through the relationships that I was building, rather than just you know getting getting in, into my own head and, and tinkering with things and and building you know solutions more manually. So um, that that was certainly one thing that um, I've learned and had to pick up. You know, there's lots of more public speaking and storytelling involved than I might have done uh, as a as a kind of scientist. Um, the, the other one I think in innovating and say, doing science in a company versus maybe doing it as more fundamental research or in academia um, is that things have to move quick forward much much quicker um, and we're much more collaborative in how we go about doing science um, and really for us it's about looking at what are the major assumptions we're making in this kind of grand solution and vision that we have and how can we perform the kind of minimal viable experiment to tackle that that biggest assumption and then from there it's basically uh, kind of going going down that list of assumptions and performing experiment after an experiment to to hit and, and cross out those assumptions and then in time we'll have something that we can get out and test with other people an early prototype we, we do take this kind of software almost software driven mindset to to our product so we started selling our first product in in february it's a a serum-free growth media designed to grow um, mammalian cells, although we developed it really on some cell lines used commonly in biomedical research. But in getting that, that product out early, we've been able to really not only build relationships, uh, stronger relationships across the industry, but actually see how that performance has has varied from different animal species and cell types, whether it be seafood or chicken or uh, pig cells that we, we hadn't initially developed it for, um, but also start understanding what is really the solution that we do need to build for this industry what does a, an early stage company that's just spinning out of maybe some some lab versus a company that's a bit further along and trying to scale their product from lab to pilot and commercial scale what are those different considerations that we're making and, and how can we uh, incorporate those into our own product development so really kind of working based off assumptions and testing those assumptions through experiments and through customer discovery and, and getting products out or something that um, has been different to, to any of the work I've done in, in academia. Um, and then the other thing, again, for me, it's, it's kind of the commercial side. So thinking about how do we 
market and, and sell this product? What are the different business models that we might uh, need to, to use here? How can we really create the most value? We're creating value through our research, but how do we pass on that value in, in, the, in the best way to our customers? Um, a, a lot of that comes in, in the business model and how you decide to, to sell your, your technology. Um, so that's been been very new for me and, and it's still something that's evolving. Um, I'd say particularly in the cultivated meat industry, whether it being so nascent, uh, it's important to think outside the box in how we can support a company from, again, spinning out of a lab to getting a new food product to market in a few years. Um, that's very different to any other food that's out there because this is very much um, kind of driven by by technology and um, new approaches to, to food production. And it's also not biotech where there are maybe existing structures in place and ways of doing things on the commercial side. So um, it's been quite um, fun actually thinking and, and exploring these different business models and trying to look at what exists in one industry and stripping it away where it doesn't work and, and borrowing and, and mixing certain uh, methods together to, to try and you know, pass on that value as effectively as possible. Um, and then just really the, the last one is, is on fundraising. So again, that's we work with grants as well as selling products, as well as raising uh, private investment, uh, equity-based investment. So um, the, these are processes that have their own rules almost uh, internally. And so there's been a lot of learning around how to break into the venture capital um Kind of market and make sure that we are presenting Multus in a way that uh, is investable and, and considering what that means as a pre-seed stage company, a seed stage company, and, and now kind of a series A stage company. So um, that, that, that's been valuable and um, again challenging, particularly in this time to navigate that in, in an effective way, because it's really there's no deadline for for fundraising. Your, your deadline is your company dying and running out of money. For investors, they'd rather see you, you know, de-risk the technology or de-risk the commercial side more, and that means waiting. And so, it's really about running a very uh, kind of controlled process where you're trying to get investors through this uh, due diligence steps at the same time, and and creating this kind of sense of uh, fear of missing out is you know the, the big is really the pressure that you have to use in, in venture capital to to get people to make a decision and, and invest. So um, that's been something that I've, I've learned a lot about. Yeah, definitely. I, I bet that it just adds a lot more challenges and, and pressures around like, you know, in, in academia, you can just make interesting things, um, make exciting projects for the sake of them being like exciting and, and pushing, you know, innovation forward. But here you, ha you have a lot of, I guess, like guardrails, a lot of like boxes that, that you're in um that that probably make it tougher because you have to deal with like the strategy and commercialization and all that stuff so yeah definitely yeah. um vibe with everything you said there um i'd like to hear a little bit more about like you know you mentioned with you had to learn some things with regards to like you know public speaking and interpersonal stuff and just kind of like being a leader right um so if you could speak more to that uh that would be super interesting like you know be, being a starting ceo especially like a a pretty young CEO, right? Like what? Yeah, what? no, for, for, for sure. And this is not something that I would say comes naturally to me. I'm more on the introverted side. And so my first kind of introduction, I guess, to to presenting and, and public speaking on a on the larger stage and presenting Maltus and, and what we're, we're building was through the competitions that we went through in, in the earlier stages. So we didn't immediately go out to, to, to venture capital funds um, we didn't have technology that we were spinning out of Imperial. This is really an idea that was driving us. And then we we're building um, the technology kind of in, in the moment. Uh, and so we, we started with different competitions and they, they were useful because they kind of gave maybe a framework. You need to have these slides in your presentation and you need to speak for, for this amount of time. So, so that was useful. And, and for me, that also meant that I was kind of forced to I guess, learn a presentation. It's not like I'm speaking maybe for 40 minutes. I have five minutes to, to convey all this information. So that, that was quite useful, I think, uh, looking back because it made, uh, made sure I was very prepared um, because in five minutes, you can't, if it's, especially if it's a pitch, you can't really make it up 
if you need to get all this specific information across. So for me, that meant uh, practicing a lot, writing down the scripts, learning the scripts, um, getting somebody to, to watch it or me recording it and then trying to um, yeah, re repeat and, and improve. I think my, my problem is I, I come across as maybe not as enthusiastic or energetic as I maybe think I am in, in my mind. And so um, that's something that uh, I've definitely had to had to work on to um, demonstrate this enthusiasm a, a bit more uh, visibly. Um, so yeah, I, th I think those, those early presentations through the competitions was something that, that really helped me there. Um, and then everything went online and that, that's very different because you actually can have a script um, and conveying that enthusiasm kind of has to be with it within this this space here and, and with your hands rather than on a stage where you can maybe walk around so that again was was different and through trial and error basically um i was able to to try try different things some work some don't i'm still uh evolving that um but i'd say it's, it's easier online i think because you can have the script there if you need to you can be in a comfortable place and prepared um but uh over time i've had the opportunity to go on stages in front of more people um and then now as covid has kind of uh dropped in, in most places around the world um i'm you know back back in public as well and i'm a bit more comfortable there haven't had the the practice in, in the meantime speaking to um lots of people online mm -hmm. for sure for sure so definitely stair-stepping the approach and and learning a lot through trial trial and error yeah I think putting myself in just uncomfortable positions. Um, I would say I, I was not, I didn't enjoy the public speaking aspect of of uh, of when I started. And a lot of it was just like, okay, this is what you have to do. So get ready for it. And sometimes it's maybe not going to go as well. But um, I think in, in the way I go about these kind of things, I, I just make sure I'm, I'm more prepared. <laughs> if if I'm if I'm I'm comfortable with it, I'll, I'll make sure I'm more prepared. So um, that it helped being forced to do it. I didn't have to volunteer because it was a matter of getting maybe a small amount of money, prize money from these competitions, and uh, I was the person that was I was presenting that um, along with my my other co-founder. Mm, I see. Um, so yeah, I I think I. I think earlier on you talked a little bit about um, how when you were first working on this, it, it didn't start as like a explicit company idea. It was kind of a project. It was, it was a you know passion you guys had for a certain topic area. And you went out and talked to a lot of people, learned a lot, read a lot. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering like, what what is one skill you nurtured during undergrad that you think kind of brought you brought you here? And uh, you're specifically in the context of like that early stuff you did, right? Like, what do you think are some habits you had maybe earlier on in undergrad that led you to being able to, you know, to take on that project and, and kind of do all that stuff. Um, and if you have any advice for people who yeah. are interested in working on projects like that. I think one of the the big ones was just to keep turning up in, in many ways. Uh, and in my mind, it was if, you know, if, if this is not detrimental really to, to anything um, and that, could work out to be something exciting then why not just keep turning up and, and that with multus meant kind of also kind of turning up to new experiences to make that that move forward and being kind of active about that uh to make sure that that project or the experience of, of multus uh, when it was a project kept moving forward um and then other things that maybe weren't moving forward i would kind of consider how i was spending that time so multus was just a project that kept moving forward it kept having an opportunity to be something um even if it had its ups and downs and sometimes it felt like it you know was going to fail at least it was moving towards failure or moving towards success um and that that was exciting to me so it's one of the the big things for me was just to keep turning up just keep seeking out and being active about opportunities ahead of you uh to keep moving things forward to some kind of conclusion um i think the, there's a tendency to to talk about a lot of things that are exciting and keep exploring things kind of in, in your mind but uh with multis is about kind of actually moving it physically forward uh and getting kind of getting getting a bit more active about it and again kind of putting more or less putting myself in in a situation where i was forced to do that you know with 
send off an application and suddenly, okay, you have to present or you have to have this deadline. Um, and that that's quite nice in a way because it keeps you working towards things. So um, putting kind of deadlines and, and opportunities in front of you, that's something I really still do all the time. It's just, um, yeah, kind of there's, there's doing work and there's creating work and you kind of need a balance of both. Um, and often the creating work is, you know, work to be done in the future. And, and that, that what, that's what kept me going forward with new exciting experiences and um with those i just kept turning up and i kept moving mm -hmm. yeah so definitely like taking risks and and just like si sign signing up for things like saying yes to things yeah, committing exactly. to things. Yeah. saying yes i think especially as as a undergrad or whilst you're in in college um there's very little to lose by by saying yes i think as you as you move forward and you know Maltus now is I have to try and say no to more things and then yes to to have that focus. But um, whilst I was at, at in college, um, yeah, I, I had very little to lose. You know, I had my accommodation, I had my um, kind of funding situation. I didn't need a salary at that stage. I was you know had had the money to try and support myself at university, as however glamorous as that was. Um, but I didn't have to worry about any of that. It was just about exploring these these new exciting opportunities um and there's in my mind only upside because either you you learn something um and it fails or you learn something and it succeeds but either way you're, you're you're learning something all the time and just going through these these opportunities um can yeah can can add new experiences new broader network you meet cool people um and there's very little downside in, in my opinion yeah definitely so um yeah I, I think you spoke about this a little bit already but um if you have anything else to say about this like what what learning experiences do you think undergrads should engage in that are currently undervalued or you think people aren't doing enough yeah i, I think some people should should try and be in, independent i guess about how they go about particularly get, getting a bit more practical with with science um or engineering whichever course they're on i know not every university has the same kinds of facilities but i think there are opportunities globally now where you can explore either entrepreneurship or explore your your own idea in a way that takes it to some kind of an interesting conclusion um and it's not just oh that that could be nice to do but i, I can't do it you know you're you're in university you have you know, amazing resources around you and, and really should make the most of them so i think pushing yourself to try something and you know, being fine with failing, um, I think that that's absolutely invaluable. Um, for me, I was maybe a bit more lucky because I grew Maltus during the pandemic and uh, that meant university I could be a bit more flexible with in terms of what I had to turn up to or how I had to prepare for exams or complete assignments. But um, I'd say that the, the value of, of university is the resources you have around you and that, that's people and facilities and the fact that you're you know have a place to stay and don't need a, a specific you know salary i know lots of people work uh to to be able to eat etc but generally you have a lot of free time and very few responsibilities so to make the the most of that during that time i would say for sure cool so um yeah i think we'll open it up to a q a now for anyone who wants to ask questions. Hey Kai, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to give this presentation today. Um, I had actually a question because I previously had worked for a company that was looking to break into the, um, I guess, sell, grow, like meat industry. Um, I noticed that you started your company in 2019, and I believe at that time there were, ex I guess, sort of the idea of using uh, a, a, needing a replacement for fetal bovine serum uh, was something somewhat of an idea that was already circulating around. Uh, as I understand it, were you guys the first people to start trying to commercialize this, or were there already competitors in the field? And if there were, how did you justify to yourself that you thought, you know, this is a worthwhile thing to pursue and, you know, spend what could have been your PhD, uh, like, time doing? But yeah, yeah, that's my question. No, no that's, that's a good question. And it's true that at the time, you know, this idea that the fetal bovine serum 
was inadequate or kind of the expensive element of growth media was a critical bottleneck in cultivated meat industry was was very clear um and that for us was i guess nicer as we were uh you know undergraduates go we, we we can't be solving scientific problems that maybe are need decades of, of kind of research experience to to get to the, the right level of expertise for us this was an engineering challenge but there are tools existing around us and it's really about applying them in new and, and interesting ways um and there, there weren't really any other companies around that were directly looking at this as a kind of as a core focus i'd say there were some others that were attaching onto the expensive components of growth media so growth factors are kind of cell to cell signaling proteins they make up mm -hmm. a, a lot of the cost of serum free growth media today um, and so there are a few companies that were directly looking to make cheaper growth factors. Um, and for, for us, we had this kind of dual focus of we want to make cheaper growth factors as well. We think computational protein design uh, is an interesting way of doing that, uh, combining that with precision fermentation. So making cheaper growth factors on the production side, but also making cheaper growth factors through higher performance and better performing uh properties so that that was really our approach to the growth factors but then it was about okay that there still is this need to replace the fetal bovine serum part um, and that means combining many more ingredients and considering a kind of a, a broader picture of what what the growth media needs to be so i'd say actually still is an unsolved you know technology in the cultivated meat industry the the gap between you know where we are and where we need to be still exists even at the the latest stage and most well-funded companies because we need to build an entirely new supply chain we need new infrastructure for manufacturing food safe growth media we new, need new ways of combining complex and food grade ingredients to grow new kinds of cells that haven't been explored before on a kind of on a fundamental research basis so that mm -hmm. still is, is a very much uh, an open space for for innovation um and you know we're, we're excited about that challenge i guess is, is what i can say about that so your your current product now or, or your first product that you mentioned earlier what exactly are you selling to companies and how are you making revenue from multis media yeah so so our first product proliferum m is a serum free supplement so it's a combination of those kind of c uh key components and growth media that uh, it supports cell proliferation. Um, and so it's a basically a direct replacement for the fetal bovine serum. So you add the supplement to your, your basal nutrients as you would with the fetal bovine serum. Um, and we're selling that as a replacement to, to the FBS. So that's what we're selling now. We also have recently started selling uh, a few of the, the key ingredients. So we do lots of work in novel ingredient discovery um, and now just started selling some of those individual components that um, that companies might use to either modify growth media formulations themselves or, or use kind of routinely as part of the production process. See, okay. Um, I have actually a lot more questions, but I don't want to like just go on a string of my own. So I'll save mine until later if everyone else has any. But if not, I'm going to keep going. I have an additional uh, question uh, on top of that. I'd actually like to break Jesse's chain real quick. Um, Kai, you mentioned the importance of like you know, kind of going down like uh, passive curiosity you know, when you have freedom and ability to do it as a student. Uh, I'm wondering if any of these accolades um, in your past and in, in your path uh, that you contribute to kind of like being a cornerstone step like founding the technology, whether it be the first product with the place for FCS or or even some of the newer products that you're pursuing now. So I, I missed the the question part of that. We say what were the key key milestones? Was that key exactly? milestones are just like uh, interesting uh, paths, like unconventional, like I guess like reading paths and science and like you know uh, I guess rabbit rabbit hole paper like paper rabbit holes that you kind of went down to kind of like I don't know uh, sparked your curiosity to kind of pursuing something and pursuing this in a different, different way. Yeah, I mean at this. In, in all honesty, I mean, this was like the, the first project really that I got deep into um, when I joined Imperial College. So I was quite lucky in that sense that it has 
continue to unfold in in its curiosity um, and we started maybe a bit narrower and, and broaden that out so we started again with this idea that growth factors were very important um, but now actually consider that you know, growth factors are, are simpler proteins that can be produced at scale fairly uh, routinely through precision fermentation the key challenge really in growth factors is the inherent properties of um, the fact that they're very unstable in how they interact with uh, cells and so um, we're kind of focusing the, focusing the innovation there really on computational protein design and how we use tools in precision fermentation that exist already tools and knowledge and infrastructure um, and then looking kind of beyond growth factors into some of those other components and growth media um, like uh, complex plant derived uh, component ingredients for example through natural product extraction so that's been something new that's come up again as, as a realization as we're starting to form this solution in the in the full growth media formulation and recognizing that okay actually this component that we thought was more important is less important um, and there are these other barriers that we can see coming up in, in the future so we'll we'll start working on them um, but there are plenty of things that we considered and you know start a little bit and then brought it back because it's a kind of too, a bit too beyond the the core focus here and again on that list of what are the big assumptions that we're grappling with that mean that our solution will uh will be true and and be valuable they were maybe too far away from from the top of that list interesting interesting i feel like uh every field every field of biotech or maybe in tech in general has a fixation on this knowledge or trend. I mean, we see this in different therapeutic, therapeutic industries, right? Especially in oncology, immunology, specifically in cell therapies. Um, would you say that growth factors is kind of like the CAR T cell level obsession of uh, of this of the space? Yeah, I think it was. Um, we see most of kind of growth media companies in, in cell ag really are looking at growth factors as a as a key enabling uh addition to to the industry um but it is, is a bit more involved than that in in our view um to create a kind of a full solution a holistic solution to growing cells affordably at scale does does mean you need to broaden the the innovation a bit beyond um just growth factors um but yeah it definitely i think that it really it was just a there's a few papers that kind of pointed towards growth factors being 99% of the cost or 95% of the cost of growth media. Um, the reality is that the price of growth factors in the biopharma industry are very inflated. Um, and so that that was, again, one of the key assumptions that we knocked off pretty early. The other one was, you know, being a protein producer actually is a very crowded industry. Um, we were looking at how we can accelerate our research by using contract research organizations. Um, and if you just put, you know, recombinant protein production, there are thousands of hits basically. Uh, and so for that, again, was a, let, let's not focus on producing and selling just one, one class of proteins. Let's actually look a bit more broadly about how we deliver a, a more full solution that can enable companies to not even have to worry about growth media at all, but focus and resources on you know, product development, taste, quality, um nutrition and even you know branding and marketing which is also very important in a kind of consumer facing um uh, company that way you get you guys are kind of going beyond the, tra the traditional scope of like what a like if a traditional biotech company is doing rather than just like we give you the product and you figure it out it's more like we're walking with you as a customer throughout the whole, the whole process exactly yeah and, and that again is, has been very valuable in getting a product out early and, and having these conversations and, and not not trying to kind of fixate on on one solution but more fixating on on the problem at hand um and that that's then evolved what we're working on thank you Claire, i have another tangent here uh, you mentioned earlier that you went through the indie bio cohorts right um actually i was on a call i a little bit of backstory and context I'm currently a student who is on the cusp of graduating from my undergraduate degree in biochemistry. Uh, and I am sitting here thinking, you know, what the hell am I going to do after I graduate? And one thing I wanted to explore was maybe going forward with a idea that I had in my undergraduate and trying 
spin off a startup out of it. And I was on a call this morning with an investor and he he mentioned that going into the indie bio cohort or applying to it might be useful. I was wondering if you could uh, talk about essentially what your experience was there, essentially what they're actually, what I'm more interested in learning about is what their expectations were. Um, because I, I just understand it, they have a demo day at the very end. And when you have all these biotech companies that perhaps their products take quite a long time to research and develop, um, Indie Bio seems to have this idea that, you know, similar to Y Combinator, where, you know, if you're a software company, you can sit down with a laptop and pump out a product in a couple of weeks, just um, powered by Doritos and like, Mountain do, but um, with a biotech company, you sort of have to get into the wet lab and start experimenting and trying something. So how was Indie Bio in that sense? Were they able to provide that kind of support? What were they expecting from you at the very end? Um, that sort of thing. Yeah, well, first of all, Indie Bio was a, an excellent experience for us. Um, usually, and one of the key kind of valuable parts of Indie Bio is that they do provide the lab space, all their kind of working towards this demo day it's, it's very it narrows the mind incredibly and, and you work really hard for the four or five months of the program to get uh ready for demo day so that that kind of environment can make kind of crazy things possible uh for us with it being in the pandemic that that shifted things slightly i think it did slow as generally in in the pace that we could develop and we had to set up a lab first before we could start start working and um didn't quite have that that uh, kind of ecosystem around us or an intense ecosystem around us, but obviously that that's in place now. Um, what was valuable for us was, was really about um, kind of the insights they had was just getting us ready for the next stage of, of fundraising and considering how, how do we, again, look at this very big complex problem and get something ready in, in four months that is actually a step forward. It is a milestone. Is this um, kind of stage gate in your development where you then are ready to speak to you know, seed seed investors? Um, so whatever kind of the kind of company is, there are always milestones that kind of you can achieve to reach these value inflection points in your company. It's not necessarily having a full product ready, but it's having you know, a certain amount of maybe traction through your customers or meeting certain certain technical milestones early on. And then as you grow, it, you know, shifts usually more towards the, the revenues and, and the business side. But if you're kind of a, a, a core bio, biotech kind of company, then certainly there are certain stages in um, proving the efficacy of your, your therapy that demonstrate kind of value inflection. And so, and yeah, in, in four or five months, you're not expected to have a, a drug that's gone through, you know, clinical trials, um, but it's maybe certain kind of key technical milestones that you can hit that then, you know, an investor would go, okay, this actually has some promise and we'll fund the next set of experiments to get you to the next inflection point. Um, so Indie Bio for us was, was great in uh, creating that focus for us during the program, but also really kind of giving us access to this network and teaching us a bit about what it takes to be a, uh, a venture backed company and there there are expectations in how quickly you you're trying to grow how big your vision is and, and the kind of uh, opportunity you're going after so um yeah no, it's, it's a really valuable experience for us okay and so i have two more questions but um prior to going into the indie bio program how did you i guess meet the people who were actually going to be grinding on this project with you um and like uh, how how did the story of the team coming together happen? Because right now I'm trying to find some difficulty actually sourcing people who know what they might be doing in terms of like uh, disclosure. My uh, idea would be engineering like probiotics and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm having a little bit of trouble who uh, of finding people who would have that expertise and would be willing to say join like a startup instead of doing like a PhD or or maybe even join up startup after they finish their PhD. Um, yeah, I mean, I think where how I found my co-founder is through this society, I and mean, we had a good year before we incorporated the company and, and formed Maltus, the 
you know, the, the company, the entity. Um, and so through that, we had a, a larger group of people involved in the project. And then as the project went along, the serious people stayed. Um, and then as we made a decision to form the company, then the people that were committed to that that mission then, then stayed. So the, there were people that dropped off along the way, um, but it was quite nice to kind of explore this as an idea and then have the time to consider, you know, what is the reality of really taking this on? This is going to be tough. We're going to be working hard. Um, there's a chance that it, it fails, but we're going to aim you know, so high that in the very small chance that it succeeds, then um, we're going to do amazing things. So um, that was useful to, I guess, have the time over the, the, the year or so that we were working on Maltus, the project. But for you, I mean, there are, there can be co-founders everywhere. You talked about meeting someone that maybe wants to do a PhD and then join you after. There are probably people that are finishing their PhD and might want to join you now. Um, there are also other programs which are also accelerator programs but instead of kind of investing in companies at the start, they invest in people. And so you you join the program and then you find your co-founders and then there's a demo day, kind of kind of intermediate demo day to then say, okay, these are the companies that we're taking through a program and then the demo day for those, those companies. So um, you could also look at like one of those or maybe even, you know, speak w within these hubs, these communities. Um, and there'll be people that are wanting to, find and start companies and um yeah i'd say just try and try and speak to people that are operating in in similar fields reach out to people people might not realize that they're you know wanting to join a startup until you, you know, introduce this amazing idea that they can't get out of their, their mind so um yeah i'd say don't, don't rush it um definitely make sure you find the right co-founder because these really are going to be a partner to you over the next you know, 10 years plus, uh, and that's longer than the average marriage. So um, you do need to complement your skills very uh, carefully. Okay. But um, yeah, try, try and try and speak to people and consider, you know, I'd say also share this idea with people. Um, yes, there's maybe some confidential elements to it, but be open with your idea. Don't be too fixated on, on the solution itself. And, and really through sharing that idea, you'll probably find someone that, um, can you know very much align to to where this could go i one final thing i also wanted to ask you about um so as i understand it maltus media is working within sort of the food tech space as well so does that mean that you've had to had run-ins with regulatory like people within regulatory systems that sort of understand that have you gotten to the point so far where you need to like talk to somebody who was an expert in this and need to work out like legalities of actually making you know, like putting certain ingredients into like a growth media or whatnot has that been yeah, an issue? There, yeah. there, there is regulation in, in food generally it's, it's on the final food product um so it'd be our customers that need to have their food properly regulated for human consumption we're really selling like an ingredient for that or even a processing aid for that production i see um, okay so we have and although looking at and speaking to regulators uh around the world to try and expedite that process how can we prepare paperwork or run certain experiments that could make that easier for our customers to do um and so we, we yeah we work with consultants to um basically do a gap analysis you know where where are we certain where are we uncertain then that speaks to regulators to ask these questions um, and from there we can know what what kind of tests or preparations we we can do there's also the the standard side so that's something that we already have been very proactive on so uh on food production standards we we have um iso 22000 certifications in place which basically mean our production processes are, are food safe Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Any, any other, other questions? questions? Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Kai, for uh, doing this with us. Uh, it was really interesting to hear about you know everything going on at Maltus and your journey and everything. And thank you guys for coming to this. Um, yeah, have a great. Thank you very much.
for everyone joining us online in the video. Thank you for watching. And uh, we hope you find this interesting. And once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday evening. Cheers. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Bye.